Hello everyone, my name is Maz Barami from More From Research. Today, Andreas will represent his 11th data science session using the Wolfram Technologies. He's a senior mathematical programmer who has been using Wolfram Technology for over 26 years. Today, he will present about the handling of large data. That means data that is too large to fit into the kernel memory. Andreas' dataset is the Amazon Customer Reviews dataset, which is about 70 gigabytes in size. He will demonstrate some data pre-processing strategies for targeted data extraction. He will show several smart queries against that data and visualize results in an intuitive way. Handing over to you, Andros. Looking forward to your 11th session. Yes, hello, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Mats. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my 11th session on my data science series. So today I will demonstrate you some techniques and strategies to handle large data. And large data goes from dozens of gigabytes all the way up into the terabytes. So that is data that is obviously still cheap to store on the hard drive, but that is too big to fit in the computer's memory. RAM is expensive. And we want to be very careful which data we select in order to load it into the kernel. We don't want to have all the data in the kernel. And again, it's sometimes impossible to even get it there, right? So we have to be making proper selections before we even load some of the data. And in the next two to three sessions, I will be talking about parallelism. And parallelism is an absolutely essential technology feature that the data scientist must be able to manage because there is so much to process and so much to compute that our systems would simply not be able to harness the amount of data and the amount of computation that have to happen if we don't use parallelism. It's just too much data and processing that we could do everything in a sequential manner. So that will be my next sessions. I will be doing them in January of 2020. So before I begin, I will be showing you some general comments about the proper use of data selection. I call it data selection because we really don't want to have all the data in memory. So I start with some general comments that help you to make your life easier when working with large data. And my number one recommendation is you want to make sure that the data representation that you have, that you have in memory or that you're preparing on the drive is only for the data that you're actively working with and you want to store that as parsimonious as possible. You should include everything that is essential you should exclude everything that is not needed. You don't want to carry around stuff that you do not need. So right from the beginning, try to get a good grasp of what data you will need for your analysis. The earlier you understand your data needs, the better it is. And as a general rule, if you don't need it, drop it, right? Think of data as a load or a cost, and you don't want to carry loads that give you no benefit. Right? For everything you carry, for every cost you pay, there needs to be some utility. There needs to be some yield that you want to uh, be able to collect. And also you can think of it as inclusion of every data element needs a justification. If you cannot justify keeping it, drop it. Right? You, you need to be very efficient with your resources. And remember, RAM is expensive memory. Most desktop computers have 32 gigabytes of RAM and most high-end computers have 128 to 256 gigabytes of RAM. So you can't possibly fit a terabyte of data in there. It just won't fit. You have to leave that on the hard drive and then make very selective decisions on which data you want to extract and only the extraction you want to load into memory. So if possible, I also recommend that you try to integrate time-consuming tasks in your daily work routine, right? If something takes an hour to process, then just submit it before you're going to lunch. And if it takes several hours to process, then submit it just before you go home in the evening, right? Let your computer run overnight, you have it the next morning. So remember, data processing time does not need your brain, 
so you can let it run unsupervised. Use your non-working time for unsupervised tasks, those things that you just fire off and they're process on their own. Right? Don't, don't just babysit your screen. You have more important things to do. Make smart choices and then use them in your downtime or your, your idle time, your non-working time. Okay, so, and with the following, you will see that I will be using the command line quite a lot. And I'm certainly not saying that you have to use the command line all the time and then from the, from the front end. You can submit the, the commands directly from the command line outside of the front end session. But if you make your front end your primary work environment, it is very practical to read the textual results directly into the kernel. And here I think readlist is my preference. Definitely know your command line tools and a lot of the data providers will require you to use data to, uh, I'm sorry, will require you to use command line tools, right? It's not that you can just load everything in there. A lot of data is proprietary, so you need extraction software and many other applications are started from the command line. You may be interfacing with other applications. So definitely know your command line tools. Some produce a lot of output that you don't want in the kernel or in the, in the output cell in the front end that you have. For example, diagnostic tools for pre-processing or checking your parallelism or checking your input-output relations, your drive speed, your memory speed, right? There's a lot of diagnostic tools where you need to run them and analyze your system, but the outputs are not part of your research. So this is definitely something that you should be using on the command line and not use the front end for. But some produce computed or passed or filtered output. We call them solutions or data extractions that we need. And that is data that you do want in the kernel. So read it indirectly and otherwise it would be tedious to even get it in the kernel. How are you gonna do it? Do you, you copy paste or run it again, pipe it into a file and then you read in the file? So it's definitely much easier to just read them indirectly into the kernel from your local session. Always think ahead and decide whether or not you want the command line output in the session. It makes your work much easier. You want the output, read it in with the read list. You don't want it, do it in the command line in the first place and don't even use your front end session for that. Okay, so now let's get started. Let's look at the Amazon customer review data and that's about 75 gigabytes. So first let's look at what do we have in the inventory. So we're reading it in. AWS kindly stores it for us in an S3 bucket and with LS we can simply list it. LS stands for listed just as it is um, in Linux. So with this we are listing what's in that S3 bucket. And here we see several files. There is one per category, sometimes more than one. So for example, we start with US uh, with apparel and comes automotive and it ends in the US with watches and wireless. We also have some other files that we don't really want. They don't have the review data that, that we want to analyze. And for this session, we are also ignoring the multilingual data sets for Germany, France, Japan, UK. These are in a different format and you see they're also relatively small. So we want to drop those. We, all, we only want to focus on the US data and they all start with Amazon underscore reviews underscore US. So only those are the ones that we want. Okay, so how much data is this? And we're talking about 35 gigabytes that we are about to download, right? So we take the inventory, we split it, and when you don't specify what you're splitting on, then the default is the space character, then take the third column, turn that from strings into numbers and totalize, right? So very simple, 35 gigabytes. So let's concentrate only on the file names, only those are the ones that we will want to be um, handling. And here we have them, these are the files. They're all the US files from apparel and automotive all the way through these categories that Amazon sells their products through down to watches and wireless. Okay, so the next step is to get them. 
and the download and this is done with an S3 copy, right? Like in, like in Linux, CP, that is the copy. This will take a while, but we can fortunately submit all of them at once. And the actual download speed now depends on your internet connection, depends on the speed of your computer, the IO of your computer. And generally speaking, it also depends on the server speed. Although in this particular case, we know that AWS S3 is extremely fast. They're really using the best of the best equipment for the servers, for their data storage, for their download technology, their network technology. So this is not a bottleneck, but always keep in mind that you can really get slowed down by a slow server on the other end. And even though we will download the files in parallel, it's still a good time now to prepare dinner as the download of 32 gigabytes of data takes some 20 minutes. Yeah, make this 35. Okay, and I've already done this for you. So this cell is unevaluatable, all right? So cell properties, it's not evaluatable. I've already done this. Next step, we now have to decompress them as they are .gz files. And again, pro combine it with a productive break right? Because it will take some 20 minutes to unzip all these files. And this can run unsupervised, right? There's no need for you to babysit a file compression. What do you expect to happen there? So now um, go and do something else, prepare dinner or empty the, the dishwasher. We will now unzip those files. And again, that's already done. The cell I cannot evaluate. And when this is done, let's look how large the data is after decompression and it's 75 gigabytes, all right? So quite a lot of data we have after the decompression. Okay, so here are now the decompressed TSV files and I only want to keep the file names. And you see here that they end with .tsv. Up here, they still had .tsv dot gz because there were still the zip files but what gnzip does is that it uncompresses them and then removes the dot gz extension so you now have the unzipped files here with the tsv extension okay and instead of submitting ls minus la to the command line and then reading it in with read list we can also use a built-in function we can use file names maybe you prefer that um, in order to see these files. This is equivalent. This is totally the same thing. Okay, so now I want to have a variable in which I store the categories. So we take all files and we extract the categories. And the category name comes after Amazon reviews underscore US underscore. Then comes a version one and then comes what I think of as an index and not all of them have them. You can see here, for example, that we have books three times. So Amazon has split that up into three files. Each file is about nine gigabytes large. So we don't wanna have 27 gigabytes in one file that we then have to parse. If we can use proper parallelism, it's much faster if we have three files, which are then relatively small, nine gigabytes, and then parse three times through each file once, right? It's the first step of parallelism. And we also have digital ebook purchase twice. So here we have the same thing, right? If the data is too large, then put it into separate files. And we see that the format is always version one, zero, zero, then version one, zero, one, version one, zero, two. So I think of these as indices. And let's count them. How often did they do it? Well, we have three times books and we have two times digital ebook purchase. All the others occur only once. But here in books, we have it three times and digital ebook purchase, we have it twice. So I think the most efficient way is now to keep actually the index with the category. So the file counter or index, I would like to keep with the category because then I can submit them in parallel afterwards. And so now I read in these categories again, but this time I keep the counter. And we have 45 files 
and you now see we have books version 100, books version 101, books version 102. And digital ebook purchase, we have version 1 with 00 and with 01. I find that easier to handle for the processing afterwards. Okay, so what are the headers that we have in these files? Okay, we have the marketplace. In our case, that is just the US because we have pre-selected them to be only the US files because the international files are in a different format. So for a review, we have the custom ID. We have a review ID. We have a product ID. We have a product parent. We have a title for the product. We have a category. Those are these files here. Then there comes the star rating for the product, the number of helpful votes that the review got, the number of total votes for the review, the question whether or not it was a Vine customer, was it a verified purchase, the headline of the review, the review body, so that's the long text that the customer wrote, and the review date. And we also need to understand what these things then refer to. The review ID refers to the particular review. But then there's also a product ID. The Vine is a customer related field. The votes are related to the review. A star rating is related to the product. So we also have to understand the interrelationships of all these columns, right? There's one line for a review, but some of these fields refer to the customer, not the review. And some of them refer to the product, not the review, right? But we get everything here in this review database. Okay, and next step in line with what I said at the beginning, in order to save space, we don't want our columns. For example, for the analysis that we're going to do today, we don't want any column that has natural language text in it for several reasons. We're not analyzing that today. In the future, we may be analyzing that perhaps for, for sentiment, right? There's a neural network that we can use in the Mathematica system to analyze sentiment. But we're not going just today, we're going to do more of a statistical analysis. And natural language is very text intensive and it then doesn't contain a lot of meaningful information. We would really have to be able to interpret the textual information. So it has a relatively high storage cost and we're not using it today. So our utility of the text for today is zero. So we don't want to have it. This would be a lot of data we'd have to load into memory and we get zero utility or yield out of it. And we don't want any natural language text for today. Also the first column, the marketplace, can be skipped because we want to drop the non-US marketplaces anyway, right? So we have only US data in the first place. So we don't need to carry the US information around. The product parent is not of interest to us and neither is the category column because the category information is already in the file name. So why carry it around as a column where every row in the columns has the same thing, right? So we really want to be selective on these columns and that's exactly what we're now going to do with cut. And I give you a short excursion here before I continue. If you think submitting cut in parallel, that would be one per category, then, and, and hope that this would speed things up significantly because each cut runs on its own thread, this will not speed things up a lot because the bottleneck for this processing will not be the CPU resources. It will be the number of IO operations. And if you use tools like VMstat 130, MPstat 2, IOStat or whatever else you use, then you will be able to identify if IO is a bottleneck. You should know, you should understand your hardware. That's very important for a data scientist that he really knows his hardware and also picks and chooses the hardware that he wants. Typically, I don't need a lot of IO resources but for your line of work, maybe you need to. So buy a computer where I.O. operations are not a bottleneck. Or if you're doing this in AWS EC2, the Elastic Cloud version 2, then pick a machine instance type that does not restrict your I.O. So make sure you understand your own system and understand that sometimes 
blaming something on poor parallelism when it's really I.O. limitations, you're running in the wrong direction. Right? So the following will give only a small speed increase when using parallelism. So I've already done it because it takes a while. The sequential version takes 486 seconds. And if I replace do with parallel do, I get it in 471 seconds. So parallelism gives you something here, but really not a lot. The percentage difference here is relatively minimal. So the bottleneck is here is I.O. It's not CPU power. I have 12 physical cores on this machine. That's 24 available threads with hyperthreading. And you see that it really didn't help much. I.O. is the bottleneck, not the parallel cores. Okay, end of the short excursion. So how much data is it now after the column selection? And we see that we got it down to 7.8 gigabytes. That's quite a lot, right? It's now maybe 10% of what it was at the beginning. We started with 75 gigabytes and we're now at 7.8 gigabytes. So we should expect a real speed up in terms of performance here. Okay, and now we are ready to import the data. We'll pick one for, for the analysis. Let's pick a category and at random I pick cameras. There's no rhyme or reason. Um, it's just something that I pick more or less randomly. So what are the headers now? This is from the, uh, the column selected version. We now have customer ID, the review ID. Well, I mean all these ones that we can analyze statistically, right? I've dropped the inessential columns and I've dropped the textual columns. Okay, so now let's import the data and you will see how fast this is. This will now take some 21 seconds in order to import the camera data, which is over 1.8 million items, right? So 1.8 million items that we're getting in something like 21 seconds. And when this is loaded, yeah, 22 seconds, let's look at the headers again. Let's get into this a little bit closer. And I use this opportunity to show you various ways to make small, relatively small modifications. And I encourage you to develop some dexterity with some of these things that we can use very quickly, interactively on your interactive session. I just want to have a column in front of it that gives me a counter that just increments by one and then I want to see the headers. So a very crude form would be to just set the counter to one and then you map this list over every element and that increments the counter, C++ increments the counter by one and then shows you the data element and you map this over the previous line which is the first of data, that's the input here. A probably more robust version is to use map indexed and hash one is the data item itself and hash two, um, yeah, hash two is the counter. So if you want them in the format that in the first column you have the counter, then in the second column you have the item, then you make it a list of hash two comma hash one. You can put this any, any order you want and use additional functions on this one, right? You could do something like a string length here, then you measure, then you measure how long the string is. You can now shuffle this around any way you want. And for this, I want the index in column one and the item in column two. So I say hash two comma hash one. A very simple form of course is that you take the column that you have, you measure the length of the column, you create a range of that. So this will go from one to the index of the last element. You transpose the matrix and you get the same result. Right? These are all equivalent ways to do that. I use this quite frequently. So I have written a function IL. Again, I want this to be short and nifty. So IL stands for index list. And my function index list is in my init.m. So another short excursion. You should go to your kernel directory of your installation and write a file init.m. And in init.m, you write functions that you use regularly, very frequently, very often. If you write init.m in your kernel directory, it will load 
every time you start a new Mathematica session. In the front end or from the command line, the script version, it doesn't matter. If it's in the kernel directory, then your init.m will be loaded at the very beginning every time you launch it. And in my init.m, I have this function for, for IL, for index list, and I use the map index version and I put a grid around this with some formatting. And what this gives me at the end is that I get this formatted table. I happen to like tables where every row is changing color in an alternating manner. Right, very easy to program and have a look at grid and the many formatting options. It will quite impress you and quite overwhelm you. Pick and choose what you like and keep the init.m in the kernel directory in mind. You can also put it in other directories, but if you put it in the kernel directory, it will be loaded every time you start a kernel and that can happen from the command line, the script or the front end. Okay, so now with that we know what these rows look like and these are column headers here. I display them as rows here, but they are really the headers of the columns. Now that we understand the headers, I want a data representation where I just have the data and then I like to use shorter and shorter names when I use it a lot. So with the rest, I drop the first line, which was the headers. So how many entries do we have? 1.8 million. And what do they look like? Okay, so the first one, I just pick one at random. And keep in mind, the random sample gives you a list of the possible hits that, that it gets. And even if I have only one, then I will still get this as a list of a list. So for example, here we see that we're talking about a one element sublist, right? This is the first element of the outer list. And this one element sublist now contains eight or nine, eight or nine sub elements, right? So that's the reason I need first here. And when I do this, then I want to map head over it because I want to know the types. So the first one, the customer number is an integer review ID and product ID are strings and star rating, then come number of helpful votes and number of total votes. Are we talking about a wine customer, verified purchase and the date, right? So here we have random sample of 10. If we use just table form and if we use table view, then we have a way to display it in a spreadsheet like form. For some reason, people still use spreadsheets. It's beyond me. In the age of Mathematica, people use spreadsheets. It's not, not possible for me to understand that, but some people like to look at it that way. So we have table view uh, for this reason. So we, you see them here, you have resizable columns and you can look at your data in a spreadsheet-like form when you use table view. Okay, so now that we understand the data, let's look at it closer. How about a histogram of the star ratings? And this is column four. So we pick column four and display it as a histogram. So keep in mind, this is over 1.8 items. And we see that five stars were given more than a million times, right? This bar here is just a little bit over a million. And I think that this is a fairly typical retail outcome when you use a five star rating. When people like it and, and like it a lot, then they give five stars. And people are not always too picky. They just like it. It's immediately five stars. For many people, five stars means no problems. I like it and there were no problems. That's immediately five stars. But some people don't like it, get critical about it, and then they write either one star if their frustration is somewhat larger, or they write four stars if it's just a little bit, if it was basically good, but not quite as perfect. So they take the maximum and subtract one. That gives you a lot of four star ratings. And then there are plenty of dissatisfied customers. So it's a, for retail five star rating, it's a fairly typical scenario that five stars is the largest column, four stars is the second largest column, and third place is one star. 
and two and three are usually trailing behind. Yeah, so this is a fairly typical outcome for five star rating in retail. And now let's look at some other columns. What are minimum, maximum, the median, and then also standard deviation for both the number of votes and the number of helpful votes. So the helpful votes are in column five and the total votes are in column six. And I also use this as a reminder that you can use slash slash query in order to get these numbers of different types for the data that you provide. I had presented this in earlier sessions, I, I believe four and five. You have to put them in a list. That's important because you apply every one of them to the data to the left, use query, and you use postfix, right? This is left to right. So take the fifth column, and then on the fifth column, ap apply these mathematical functions. So we have a minimum of zero, a maximum of five, five, one, three, two. That's quite a lot, right? Think about this. You write a review and 5,132 votes are cast on, on your review. And the median is zero. And I'll be talking about this more detailed in a moment. And there's a mean and there's a standard deviation. And also for the total number of votes, that's column six, right? So in both cases, we are getting a median of zero. And I would like to go into detail on this a little bit more. Because what does it mean? A median of zero indicates that a lot of reviews received no votes at all. So let's see how many received zero votes and histo the number of total votes and in percentages, please. Okay, so here I'm taking the sixth column and I do accounts by the, the, the number of votes larger than zero. Okay, and counts by gives me an association. And the next step, I look where this is true, where this was more than zero, and I want them divided by the total length, so they should give me a percent number, and then I say percent form, and then I want to histo this. Okay, and we see that in 957 cases, 957,000 cases, we have a zero. And only in 844,000 cases do we have more than zero, okay? And expressed as a percentage, we get 46.8%. So keep in mind, this was over 1.8 million items. So for 1.8 million items, this is below half and this is above half. And we see that for larger than zero, we have 47%. Now, what does this mean when we have the 957.883 here and look at the tooltip in the hover, right? This is the 957.883 that we have here. And that means the 844,000 is everything else. But everything larger than zero still is less. It cannot even come close to the 957. There's still more than a than 100,000 difference between them. That means starting with one and everything to the right here accumulated is less than the height of this bar, okay? So the median pretty much has no choice but to lean towards zero. One way you can think of a median is perhaps like a pivot or pivot the pivot point of a scale, right? When it's turning right or left, it pivots around the pivot point. So you really see the bulk of the volume, more than 50% is in the zero column. So the median is a zero, right? Everything up, everything else, one and upwards cannot come close to the 958,000 that we have here. Okay, so perhaps this gives you a better understanding on how to understand the median. Okay, let's look at a date plot of the number of daily reviews over time. So let's look at a time series of this. And we're doing this again with counts by, because I do wanna have the date extracted. I know the dates are in the last column, and here's a time series plot of 
all these reviews as they have developed over time. And we see there were a couple of spikes. There's an overall trend that goes up. And another thing I, that I can explain at this point is that the last column, the dates, came as strings. I never had to convert them into date objects that you remember from two sessions ago. The dateless plot is smart enough to understand this. So we just take the string form of the date and we can still use it and dateless plot has no problems interpreting that and then gives us the dateless plot. Okay, let's look at the distribution of the number of votes given and get my reminder on the proper use, I mean on one of the many uses of queries you can produce different types of data in one line. So here I'm looking at the third column and I only look at the values run then and then I look at these functions that we looked at before. And here we see that we have a median of two, right? You see the median is the second element, this is the second element. And I'd like to do a similar analysis again here. This is the median that, that is not one, it is two, not three, because again, all the possible cases where we had more than one. Here I'm using counts by hash larger than one. And the example above I used is zero. Here the lowest category is one. And I count them here and we get 96,000 96, and it's false for 72,000. So that means that we have 96,000 where we have more than one, okay? That means from here, from number two upwards, everything that's larger than one, that's two, three, four, five, and so forth. And all of them taken together are really the majority. Here you have 96,000. For larger than one to be false, we only have 73,000. And these 73,000 we have here in this column one. So here clearly the next higher category wins. They have the larger amount of totals. And that means that two is our pivot, right? So median goes to number two in this case, simply because this sum from two and everything above is larger than what we have in one. So here it is two as the median. Okay, next let's look at how many times were the indicated number of reviews per customer given in camera. So again, I do this analysis, min, max, median, mean, and so forth, but then I want to histo the whole thing. And here again, we get a median of one and again, we'll look at this in a moment and we can see a similar thing here as well. And let's do this line directly immediately. So here we start again with one, not with zero. And we see that the check larger than one is true in only 273,000 cases and it's false in 843,000 cases. So we can clearly see that the number of people, the number of customers who wrote more than one is the smaller number. That means two, three, four, all of these accumulated is less than the 843,000 that we have here. So clearly this bar wins against the totalization of all the others, which means one is the median, all right? Think of it as the pivot. This is where, this, where the weight, the, the, the larger weight pivots to. All right, how many reviews in camera came from Vine customers and what percentage is that? Okay, this would be a very small in number. There's not a lot of Vine customers at Amazon. And we see this reflected here as well. So we look at column seven, we count them and we see quite an imbalance here. We have less than 1.8 million and only some 8,000 Vine customers. So, that is already a small, very small 
percentage of it and in percentage form it's 0.4375%. Not that this is 0.43%, it's not 43%, right? It's 0.43%. Percent. percent form already multiplies with 100. So really a, a relatively small number of, you know, of, of customers are Vine customers. Okay, so how many reviews in camera were for verified purchases and what percentage is that? So again, I'm using counts here. I really suggest you get familiar with counts by and counts. And here we see that we have about 1.5 million were verified purchases and only 307,000 were not verified purchases. So the verified purchases are 83%. Okay, so next, let's look at some helpful votes numbers of the verified purchases. So this information is in the eighth column. So I'm selecting all those records where in the eighth column we have a Y that makes it a verified purchase. The unverified purchases then are the complement of that. I think of this as set minus. It is, it is one minus the other, but in a set sense. So we take the whole set D, we subtract all the verified customers, leaves us the unverified customers. A good way to think about complement is set minus. Right? That is minus, but in the set sense. Okay, so of all the verified purchases with more than 200 helpful votes, who are the top 10? And in the second row, I do this with 300 votes. And this is an example where I would like to show you how Occam's razor works. So we are picking 200 in the first place. We need to have at least five, we need to have at least 200 helpful votes. And from those, I'm then extracting who, who is that, the number of helpful votes, the number of total votes and their ratio only of the verified customers, remove the problems, and then sort by the fourth column. Now this is the fourth column, one, two, three, four. So the ratio of helpful votes to total votes is the fourth column. Then I reverse the whole thing because I wanna have the top 10, then I actually take the top 10, and this is the result that we have here in these tables. So I want to show you a couple of things here that should hopefully prepare you for Occam's razor. You can think of this as the entry condition. You need at least 200 helpful votes in order to be even selected for this, for this analysis here. In this example, we are raising the bar. The acceptance criterion is higher. You need to have at least 300, right? So you can expect the list here to be shorter. Here, the entry requirement is lower, right? That's Occam's razor. But then we're looking only at the top 10. If you look at more, then we could have things, we could have people in there that didn't make the cut previously. So let's look at some of these results. What I find particularly interesting is that this guy here got 927 votes and 922 of them were voted helpful by the customers. I think this is a remarkably high number. It's 99.4%, this number here. Okay, but he's not included in the first list, even though the entry criterion was lower, right? If he has more than 300 and he did, he had 922. So he clearly was above the 300, but that certainly also means he was above the 200. But now in the sort, we are sorting by the percentage. And here we have people with, uh, with higher percentages at a lower ranking, but at the lower entry threshold. So for example, the lowest in the top 10 got 99.7%, and this is above his number here. He only got 99.4%. Well, that's because we're taking the top 10 in both of them, all right? He didn't meet the high percentage requirement. He's below the top 10 of the first category. His percent is only 99.4, but he got much more reviews and he got much more favorable reviews, right? So 
he would definitely be included in the first list, but not in the top 10, because we are sorting it by the percentage. And it's much easier to get higher percentages of helpful reviews if you accept more people in the first place. I should say helpful if you accept more reviews in the first place, not people, right? So the lowest of the top 10 is higher than the percentage that he got, even though he got much more votes and much more helpful votes. This is how Occam's razor works. The entry criterion here is very important. This is your entry selective filter. Okay. All right. What's the largest number of votes cast camera and who is it and what product is it? All right. So let's look at maximal buy in the last column because that is the last column, the sixth column. That's the number of the total votes. And from the verified and unverified separately, these are the numbers. So this is the customer. This is the product. And we have 5,132 helpful votes out of 5,287 total votes for this particular product. And for unverified, we have a similar story. So these are fairly high numbers, but it's only 0.97. So it didn't make any of the lists here, right? I mean, the number of helpful votes is in the few hundreds. And here we're talking about 5,200, 5, right? But we're looking for the top 10 sorted by the percentage. And his percentage is only 97%, even though the absolute numbers are so much higher, right? Here, we're going by absolute numbers. And in the last column, we are going by percentages or relative numbers. So that explains that he isn't in the top 10, even though these are insanely high number of votes that were cast and then afterwards considered helpful. Okay, so for the rest of this session, I want to now pick a specific customer and analyze the data a little bit more for one particular customer. So let's take this guy again. That's him here with the 927 votes cast on his camera review with 922 considered helpful. Let's pick this 5089 guy. So he wrote a review that got 927 votes and 922 of them were positive. So I think this guy really seems to know what he's talking about, at least for that one product, at least for this one camera that he had reviewed. So Next, let's get all of his reviews across all categories because presumably he didn't just buy cameras, right? So let's look at everything he bought and reviewed. And this goes through all the 7.7 .7 gigabyte of data that we have. So I'm now gonna submit a grab for this particular customer number. This is the customer ID in everything. Here's the star, right? We're going through everything now. And look how fast that was not even 11 seconds because we did a very selective choice of columns, getting the data down to 7.7 .7 gigabytes. We now have to do some formatting because this came back, um, I read it in as a string, but that's really not a big deal. All we basically do here is that we turn the numbers that come in as strings into expressions. So we have them as numbers. That's pretty much the only thing I need to do here in this string processing. And next, I want to show you another example of using grid with proper formatting. You may or may not like this type of display. So what I take is that I take these all reviews variable that I have, and I add, I, I remove the first, the first element because that's the customer ID, but we know that already. We picked one particular, and instead, this, this, this query is now across all the categories. That means category should come back in. We had dropped it earlier because we only looked at cameras. Now we have a different view. Now we look at one particular customer, but all categories. So I'm putting category back in in the first column, right? Rest removes it and then prepend, adds it at the beginning. And 
we can get different alternating backgrounds here. And I also want to point out an important alignment option that we have for grid. We can now specify row ways, use two opening braces here, right? If it's by row, otherwise it's by column. So we have left, left, left for the first three. That's because they're strings and strings are usually left aligned. Um, let's pick a white background row. And when you use a dot, that means a line at the decimal point. Now these are integers, so we don't have any decimals, but you can think of the integers having a decimal point of 0. 0.0. As a number, of course, that would make it a real, but for formatting purposes, you can assume there's a decimal. So when you use dot for column alignment, you get numbers aligned at the decimal, which is exactly where we want it. And then right, 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 because these are one character strings and I typically want one character strings aligned to the right. That's a matter of choice. You can say I also want it on the left, like all the strings. If it's just one character, I personally prefer to put them to the right, but that's a matter of choice. And then we have the date column, which here is also a string. Okay, so items to take away. You can sometimes make a very simple column label switch just by dropping something and prepend, prepending something else. Look at the background formatting options in grid and get familiar with the alignment options. If it's row-based, row -based, you need two opening braces and remember the dot for the decimal points, right? Works for integers, for reals, for all sorts of numbers. Okay, so now that we have this, what were the products that you bought? Okay, these are the products that you bought. And how many reviews did you leave? Okay, that would be the length of the second column. He left 78 reviews. Okay, next give me a histogram of the star reviews of the products that he bought. Okay, so he bought mostly products that got three stars by all the customers. And in what, what categories did he buy? And again, I want to show you several formatting options here so that you get familiar with some presentation options that you have when you start your work as a professional data scientist. You may like them, you may not like them, right? But sometimes people like tables and sometimes people like pie charts, people like different color choices. And we also have this great presentation style of the association. I think this is a nice presentation way to begin with because here in this case we have counts. So he bought two things in apparel. He bought five things in baby. So apparently they just had some, some new arrival. He bought three books in zero zero and he bought 11 books in zero one. Right. In camera, he bought only four things. One of them we had looked at earlier and so forth. Right. He bought two things in music. He bought three things in office products. He bought two watches and so forth. Right. And then I want to show you again four formatted tables and mostly here the background coloring options. You may like white with a faded out bluish light blue tint. You may like cyan, you may like yellow, you may like white with light gray, right? So get familiar with the background options in grid as all of these here use grid and pick whatever you like, right? It depends on the style of your presentation. So this is it a technical presentation? Is it a business presentation? And so forth. Next, I want to show you a pie chart. And with a pie chart, I usually like the callouts. You can see that I use callouts here that I'm mapping over the data elements. I like the chart style temperature map, although the, the colors are pretty crass, I think. We use the keys as the legend indicators. So here you have this as a pie chart. Right? The call out uses the number of elements that he has. These are the values from the association above. 
and we have them also in the legend which we are using as the keys here and of course we oftentimes also like the bar chart and this is similar here i use c the counts again i use again the temperature map chart style again i use the keys of the element for the chart legend and then this looks like this it's the same legend and here you have the elements and the bar chart and you can get the actual count with a hover as a tooltip okay how helpful were his other reviews we can also look at that we look at all the reviews and here again i'm using a bar chart now keep in mind through this division this is limited to one this can never get larger than one but I think we can see that in almost in, in most cases, at least half of them or so, he pretty much exhausted the helpful reviews category, right? This is a lot of reviews where he got high numbers in terms of, of helpfulness. And that given that I'm dividing by the total number of reviews, these sum up to at most one. This is a bar chart that now shows us relative percentages, right? Keep in mind here, this is a division and we're dividing the number of helpful reviews by the number of total reviews, okay? Overall, when I look at this, there is more yellow than white in this or orange than white in this, which means mostly he writes very, very, very helpful reviews. Okay, so how many of his reviews were at least 50% considered helpful, okay? So now we say counts by of this data and we're comparing this to a half, how many were larger than a half. And that's the case in 53 out of the total, false only 12, right? So in 53 or 68% did people rate it helpful in at least 50% of all cases, all right? And I think I've used it before, but I didn't address it yet. In order to save time, I sometimes put an, a, a temp variable, t or temp or something else, in a previous cal calculation. In order to save it away, I call it an interceptor variable, right? That's just my thinking of it. It's not an official name for this. I call it t equals, and now I'm saving this computation in it. That means here I don't have to compute it again. Now this is not a very time consuming computation, right? It wouldn't really be necessary here, but this selection here is already done for me. All I need to do is put T equals in front of it and then I can use it directly later. If this were a time consuming computation, then I would save a lot of time because then I don't have to recompute it again. I can really focus on the counts in this case. I really can concentrate on the comparison. Is it larger than a half or not? Okay. So I recommend doing that, especially when you have computations that take a long time. Store them away and then you don't have to recompute them. How many of us purchases were verified purchases? All right, this is a similar analysis. Again, I'm saying counts in order to get an association. I now use the eighth column. That's the information whether or not it was a verified purchase. And he made 37 verified purchases. He made 41 unverified purchases. And that comes to a percentage of 47%. And what was his review activity over time? We can now also take the last column and you remember this is date, but in string form, date histogram has no problem interpreting it. We don't have to convert it to a date object. This is his review activity over time from 1999 all the way to 2016. Okay, this is it for today. And Mats, are there any questions? Thank you, Andras. Uh, there has been, you know, some interesting comments, but not particular question. Uh, let me add that, you know, there was a comment about format of, you know, these sessions. Yes, 
Andras liked this technical format and we find it very productive to do it this way. Um, since there is no more question, I think we can wrap up our session. This was the 11th session of data science with Andras Lauschke. Today, he discussed handling of large data. We can find the playlist of Andras recorded videos on the Wolfram YouTube channel. You can also interact directly with Andras through Wolfram community. Thanks for watching and have a good one.